Hello, and welcome to Donors of Tomorrow, Effective Ways to Engage Young Audiences. This is a Mighty Citizen webinar, and I'm Rachel Clemens, and I'm joined by Caroline Fothergill. Hello. We're going to do intros in a moment, but first let's talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about the long-term sustainability of your nonprofit. When we work with our clients, you know, a lot of their focus, and perhaps rightly so, is on major gifts and major donors and those audiences tend to be in the older boomer generation they tend to be you know in their 60s at least um, but if you want your nonprofit to be thriving in 20 to 30 years we want to go ahead and look at our younger audiences and how to engage them now so that they stick with us and become our major donors when they are able to do that. So uh, for your organization, you'll need to decide, you know, how much effort you put into younger donors, but you really don't want to ignore them either. So there's a sliding scale of effort there, and we'll talk about what that might look like today. So I'm Rachel Clemens, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Mighty Citizen. If you're not familiar with Mighty Citizen, we're a branding and digital transformation agency for mission-driven organizations. That means that we help nonprofits basically boost their revenue and increase their impact in their communities. And we do that primarily through branding, messaging, marketing, fundraising, websites, analytics, on and on and on. Um, I have a funny story and Caroline will appreciate this, I think. Um, we put in to speak on this topic at AF AFP's International Conference, and that's the Association of Fundraising Professionals. And when we submitted, they accepted us on the conditions, was conditionally accepted, under the condition that I, Rachel, speak with an actual young person. <laughs> Rude. A bit. <laughs> bit of a uh, stab to the heart, to be honest, um, because they don't ask you your age when you submit. They solely went by the photo. So <laughs> thanks, AFP. Um, but I do believe that the presentation is way better having Caroline join me because she is the voice. Oh, the silver lining. <laughs> of the youth of America. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Caroline Fothergill. I am the marketing strategist here at Mighty Citizen. Um, so I do a lot of content creation, but also measuring uh, marketing efforts and their effectiveness. So by the end of the session today, you will know what motivates young audiences to give. What do they care about and what's driving them? What millennials and Gen Zers want from nonprofits. So when we say young audiences, we're talking primarily about millennials and Gen Z. Within your organization, you may also be talking about Gen X. I've talked to a lot of um, organizations where they're like, oh, our young audiences are under 50. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm still young. Um, but so you'll decide within your organization what you mean by young. But today, primarily, we'll be talking about millennials and Gen Z. How to create effective campaigns that tap into these generations and um, basically get them excited about your organization. Now, I have to say up front that there will be generalizations in this session. You can't really talk about generational uh, information without making some generalizations. No two millennials are like, no two Gen Z are like. Um, they are unique and wholly um, different among themselves, but we will be talking about sort of what drives them generationally. I thought this was a good way to sort of start our session today. Um, the quote says, I see no hope for the future of our people if they are dependent on the frivolous youth of today. Now you might be thinking, hmm, where's that quote that could come from my father? <laughs> Something like that. Where does this quote come from? Um, it's actually from a Greek poet and writer um, named Hesiod from the eighth century BC. So all of this to say that people have been doubting the young um, for centuries, it's been going on for ages. We will not be doing that today. I am so excited about these generations and we'll be talking really about the passion and the capabilities that they have within them. So let's talk about what we're talking about when we talk about young audiences. So these dates are not set in stone, but generally millennials, um, that generation runs from about 1980, so born in 1980 or so, up to about 1994. 
Um, our oldest millennials are joining the 40 Club, so welcome. And our youngest millennials are around 25. Um, so they have been in their careers theoretically for a couple of years now or a few years now. Some people call them entitled hipsters. Some people call them visionaries. I imagine they are a little bit of both, um, you know, two sides of the same coin. And so uh, we'll be talking today about how they see themselves. Gen Z, also these numbers are still changing and adapting a little bit. Um, they tend to run from about 1995 to about 2010. So um, as these graphics show, that's a huge change. Mobile yeah. phones really came, I mean, we only had, we've only had mobile phones for about 15 years. So look at the size of shares, mobile that. phone in that I picture. <laughs> from Clueless, that is amazing, yes. She was like one of the first to have the massive cell phone, right? <laughs> And then Angry Birds, which have sadly come and gone at this point. Um, but are there, so that shows that these guys, the youngest of them, is not even quite ten. Um, so, are they social media addicts or are they activists? Um, they do hunger for and to be influencers, um, and they really treat celebrity and um, those that they look up to different than older generations. So they look to social media to find their influencers. You can be famous pretty much only on social media at this point. Um, and so these audiences, we're going to talk about how they have the potential to really change the world. Super exciting. I, I actually have a Gen Z year. Aww. So I, also a little tied to that. So the average attention span of these generations, and guess what, everybody, is actually 8.25 seconds. This number has decreased over the last 10 years or so. Um, in the early 2000s, we were up to about, I think it's like 12, mm -hmm. 12 seconds. Um, with the proliferation of devices, we have dropped to about 8.25 seconds. Thanks, Apple. <laughs> Thank you, Apple. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And that is less than a goldfish. Um, goldfish has about nine seconds of attention span, so we're all swimming in that same sad pool. <laughs> um, let's talk about what these generations have in common. They understand technology, born and raised with computers in their homes, um, and really understand how technology should work and think you should too. They're diverse and they celebrate it. These generations are more likely to choose other on a census form than any other generation. And they want to see that represented in your branding. They're used to being marketed to, um, you know, we call it content marketing, still advertising, still marketing, and they know it. Um, they don't want to be sold to. So we have a client, we were doing a focus group and it was actually an association talking about um, appealing to young members and they brought in a group and, and what they kept hearing over and over again was don't sell to me. I don't want you to sell to me. I want you to be authentic and real. So we'll talk about what that looks like. They get their news and views from social networks. They often do this before. Um, so they're more likely to get breaking news on their devices in social um, versus other generations where it was like radio and television. They definitely want to better the world and their communities. This is great news for those of us in the philanthropic space because um, our generation has really arrived. They want stories to build connection. This is a human trait more so than a young person trait. Um, I think of Humans of New York as a great example of storytelling. And that organization was able to raise over $3 million in three weeks alone for pediatric cancer through their storytelling. They give mostly on mobile and small, spontaneous burst. We call it fits of charity. Mm -hmm. uh, Caroline's going to illuminate some of this for us a little bit later. Um, but they are giving mostly on their phones and in um, small, spontaneous moments. Also, um, about this generation, this is from BlackBot's 2018 Next Generation of Giving report. And what you'll see here is um, the darker purple color is 2013 and the lighter violet color is 2018. You'll notice that Gen Z was not even on the radar <laughs> five years ago or six years ago. Um, and so they pop up here in 2018. This is the percentage of self-reported donors. So those generations that are reporting, they are giving. 
And what you'll notice is that um, millennials are really up there with Gen Z or, or sorry, Gen X now um, in terms of their self-reported number of donors. And Gen Z is not that far behind. No, they're really not, yeah. which we'll talk about like them as givers. Yeah. Um, and so this is just kind of important to kind of show the relevancy of these generations and where they sit among their peers. This is showing the contribution to total giving. So the percentage of total dollars donated. Again, this is from Blackboard's Next Generation of Giving Report. What you'll notice here on the left especially is that boomers and Gen X and matures are definitely still giving the majority of the donations. So they make up about 84% of total donations. That's a huge amount. That's why we're giving so much focus to them. Um, millennials and Gen X, Z make up about 16%. So they are up and coming, but they are lower for sure. On the right, what you'll notice, I want you to pay attention to, is their contribution to total giving. You'll notice that boomers and matures are dropping. And the reason for that might be many, but one of them is that they're aging out and they're old. You know, they were losing them. Um, uh, but you'll notice that the other generations are giving more and starting to be on the map. This is a, some content from Classy, and I just love this. This is Gen Z, and um, they call them the Philanthro Kids. So cute. I know, which I love because I'm like, our generation has arrived. Yes. We've all been waiting for like a generation to show up that really wants to change the world, and I feel like they're here. Sorry if you thought millennials were going to be it, and then we <laughs> let you down. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, maybe, but it's kind of like uh, Oprah, like you get a generation and you get a generation. Yes. Um, so just some fun facts about Gen Z. They'll make up 40% of all customers um, by 2020. So next year we're filming, I mean, we're recording here in 2019. Um, so they are going to make up a huge portion of that population. 60% um, of them want their work to make a difference in the world. So they are visionaries. They believe in their ability to change the world. 76% are worried about the planet. If you are an environmental organization, you have got to be focusing on this audience, especially. 30% um, have already donated to an organization, and remember, they're young. And then they are predicted to prefer mobile apps for giving. And when it says mobile apps, just remember, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to go out and create an app. It just means that your mobile experience has to be really good because that's where they're giving. Um, so just some great and exciting information about Gen Z. This is also from Blackbaud's um, Next Generation of Giving Report. You'll notice that millennials tend to give to worship, children, local social service, health, and animals, where Gen Z right now is giving more to children, animals, health, than worship, than social service. As a rule, um, these organizations or these generations um, really want to think of themselves as allies, advocates, activists. They believe in the power of lifting all boats, um, and they tend to um, care more about large social issues than um, necessarily personal connections to a cause. So if you think about the Women's March, March for Our Lives, these are all young people movements, things that they have really pushed, um, and they believe in equity, equality, and opportunity. Ooh, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. It is early. <laughs> all right. Um, Let's see. Now, if you want to reach younger audiences, you've got to listen to your data. That means you have to have good data mm -hmm. in your um, donor database. Hopefully you have an idea of people's birth dates or their um, birth years. Um, and you can look at that data and run it against your analytics and see which channels and content preferences these younger audiences have. So if you have that information, you can look and see what um, in which places are they interacting with us? Which content are they clicking on most? What content is driving donations from these audiences? Is there a time of year that they're more likely to give? A type of campaign they're more likely to give to? So you can run this data. They're already telling you their preferences um, through your content that you're putting out right now. And you want to consider segmenting these audiences generationally so that you do understand um, what drives them. So if you decide you want to do a campaign specifically to younger audiences, I would look at your data and your analytics and see what you can glean from that about your particular younger audience.
We have gotten the question a few times, if you don't have that information to start with, if you don't have birthdays and you can't break it out by age, you might need to put out a big old donor survey mm -hmm. with an incentive possibly to collect as much of that as you can. That's right. I'm gonna hand it over to Caroline. All right, so here I am, your millennial guinea pig to share my personal habits, good or bad, and experiences. Um, when we first did this together, I thought it'd be interesting to go back through um, a full year and see how many organizations I gave to and how much. So um, here's my breakdown from 2018. And just for reference, I was 27 years old at this time. I was in grad school, so I didn't have a lot of um, disposable income, but I gave to five different organizations that year, and these were all one-time gifts, and these were absolutely all spontaneous bits of charity. Um, they were unplanned. One of them was inspired by a company match here at Mighty Citizen, um, so that was sort of the motivation. The others are clearly tied to social and political events. One was a natural disaster. So um, just this year, now in 2019, I've started giving to a couple of orgs on a monthly basis as a 28-year-old, and that's my first time doing that. So there is hope to get people my age to start giving um, on a reoccurring basis. But I want to share one story, and this was the disaster relief gift that I gave that year. When the horrible campfire was going on in California, you know, everyone heard about it on the radio every day. It was all over the news. And a couple weeks into that coverage, I saw this one post on Instagram posted by what you would call a micro influencer. She's a jewelry designer um, on Etsy with maybe 10,000 followers or something. And she was going to drive down to rescue a bunch of stray animals from the fires, bring them back up to Portland and put them in shelters where there was room and this is what motivated me to give out of all the coverage I'd been hearing the fact that this one woman was motivated to do this on her own and start a GoFundMe is what inspired me um, so I went to donate to her page but I didn't have a GoFundMe account and I had to create this long account fill out this whole form and it was nighttime I was in my bed and then I didn't have my credit card information and I was like you know what I'll just do it in the morning and then five days later, I realized <laughs> I never made that gift. And I was like, shoot. So instead of going back to her post, I just went straight to GoFundMe and ended up spending like an hour looking through all the different fundraisers and giving to a different one. So it just shows that the technology has to be so, so seamless and easy, or you're going to lose me in that moment, in that fit of charity when I'm motivated to give. Because when you went back to GoFundMe, you couldn't find her, her GoFundMe. It may, I maybe it had closed already or something, but I ended up giving to one of the big like Red Cross ones after all that. So yeah, um, we want seamless technology. I think that story really kind of brings that to life. But in terms of your actual donation form, what that means is. It, it's not just mobile friendly anymore. It's mobile first. Your site needs to be fully mobile responsive. A lot of our nonprofit clients are now at the, the tipping point where 50% of their traffic is mobile, 50% is desktop, and mobile is continuing to rise. Um, so it's just thinking differently about your website. And Google wants this too. They're prioritizing when they're ranking where you show up in search results, they're focusing on how your mobile site looks. So it really needs to um, be sharp and seamless. And this likely means customizing the donation form that you have out of the box with your donor platform, doing some A-B testing to really find what works for you. Keep it simple. Um, remember my campfire anecdote. If you don't need me to create an account the first time I give, then just don't ask for it. Um, if there are any fields in your form that you're not using right away, like title or my address, my phone number, phone number. Uh, if you're not going to call me, don't ask for it. <laughs> keep it, keep it clean. Um, and then lastly, your thank you page, give me something to share, um, to brag about the fact that I gave that is totally millennial stereotype about us wanting a lot of recognition, but it's true. I want to be able to, um, share some sort of graphic or video or use a hashtag to share that I gave to your organization. And if you're going to promote uh, monthly giving, which you should, and you should nudge people in that direction, for millennials and Gen Z, we're used to this subscription experience, right? We pay $10 a month for 
socks, underwear, food, dog food, all kinds of things. So we're used to that and we're okay with spending a, a small amount every month if we feel like we're getting something in return. Um, and Charity Water is obviously an amazing example of this with their spring program that definitely targets young people. A lot of what they give in return is digital content, like monthly good news. Um, and I do give to them every month and I get these really sweet videos, a lot of personalized content, um, just showing exactly what my impact has been, even if I only give a little bit. Um, and I love this message. It says, we're building a passionate community of changers to fight with us month after month until every single person on this planet has clean water. That is so tangible and it feels like something that we can achieve together. Here's another example. This is um, one of our clients, Meals on Wheels of Central Texas. And you can see they're nudging a monthly gift right on the homepage. This little um, donation bubble has monthly set as the default. And of course, when you get into the form, you can select a one-time gift. But another point I wanna make here is they have a beautiful photo of a young person right on the homepage. They're trying to appeal to people my age. We wanna see ourselves and feel like, okay, other people like me are, are involved in this as a young, fresh organization. All right, let's talk about social media. <laughs> don't tune out, I promise it'll be good. Even if you don't like it, which a lot of us don't love managing it, it's really important um, and you'll be happy to know that I want you to do a little bit less and do it better. So if you think of stop and count how many social platforms your organization is on, there are really seven big ones at this point. And if you are on more than two or three, I think you're doing too much. So you need to know where to target those young donors that you're going after. You can't just say, okay, we want to reach all young people. Let's get more specific. Is it a subset of Gen Z that's really passionate about climate change, for example? Which platforms are you going to find those young people on? Um, one pro tip is that a lot of CRMs actually have something called a social lookup, where based on the email addresses and other information that you have on your contacts, it'll find their social social media accounts and you can easily go and connect with the people who are already in your database. So that's a nice way if you don't have a big following um, to start. User research may be required to determine which platforms you should be active on and what kind of content um, the young donors you're trying to reach really want to see. Test, test, test. Um, there's no simple solution for social. You really just have to try things out and be willing to um, experiment and then look back and see and analyze what, what's working and what's not. So yeah, it's a lot of experimentation to see what sticks. And if you try to think of that as being fun instead of, of frustrating, <laughs> yeah, but you need somebody to manage it and it, it really can be a big job. Um, this is another chart from that same Blackboard report, and you can dig into this uh, later or pause to look at it more deeply, but it shows which, what percentage of each generation is on each social platform, and then which percentage is engaging with charities on that platform at least once a month. I think this is really interesting, and it, it debunks some myths like the myth that Gen Z is not on Facebook. They are, they're just uh, behaving on Facebook differently than where their parents can't find them, which is on Snapchat. <laughs> is Baylor on Snapchat, Rachel? Oh, no. Not yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> Your time will come. My time, it, who knows what it will be by then, right? Yeah. And then Instagram is really um, becoming, I think, the most powerful uh, platform to reach both of these generations where we're all kind of coexisting, at least at the moment. So I want to talk about a few reasons why you need to be using social um, and ways that you can use it to attract young people. We do love recognition. It's true. We want something in return when we're supporting you. And that could mean physical swag merchandise, or it could mean digital love. Like this graphic is an example from um, a campaign we did with United Way for Greater Austin, where they took their volunteers and donors and did a thank you graphic, actually tagging them and thanking them 
personally, this is gold because you bet this guy's going to share it to his own uh, feed and sort of humble brag and say, oh, look, thank you so much for recognizing me. And then your engagement goes through the roof because they're sharing it with their whole network. Make your thank yous Instagram worthy. A phone call is nice, it's personal, but it's not really what our generations want because we want something we can repackage and share. Um, it could be sending something physical in the mail that we can take a picture of that's really beautifully designed and appealing. It could be, like I said, a graphic or a video, something that we can share digitally. Social activism, you've definitely seen uh, people put, you know, the equal sign or the rainbow flag, different filters. They're called twibbons over their profile pictures. Um, we love this because it's an easy way. And this is totally the millennial stereotype. Like we'll put this up, but we won't actually go and give or do anything. <laughs> but it's a good way to get us in the door and then you can continue to engage. So let's talk a little bit about each platform and how to use it for fundraising and relationship building with young people. On Facebook, it's all about peer-to-peer. -peer. The birthday fundraisers are huge. I do think Charity Water was the first group to really capitalize on the birthday fundraiser, but they're still a big deal. Um, I think in the first year of the birthday fundraiser, $300 million was raised for charities. In, the, in that one year alone, it's pretty incredible. Um, and, it's, and it's not slowing down. So you need a big old donate button on your Facebook page. But beyond that, you need to be thinking about how to get your people to run their own fundraisers on here. On Instagram, it's all about visual storytelling. Look at Ricky Bobby. Ricky Bobby on wheels. <laughs> if your if your uh, organization is an on a animal focused, obviously it's harder to tug the heartstrings. These photos are both really cute, but um, it has to be beautiful, visual, captivating because people are scrolling fast. You need to catch their attention and then tell a story. Um, Rachel brought up the Humans of New York example. They shared a lot of stories before they asked for anything oh, yeah. or tried to raise money for anyone. So if you're just putting out really beautiful story content, I promise it'll pay off. When you do ask for something, people will respond because they're bought in. Instagram stories. Um, maybe this is an area you're kind of neglecting because it's a lot of work and it disappears in 24 hours and it might feel like, oh my gosh, what an investment. But it's just like the name implies, it's amazing for storytelling. This is an example from a, a refugee support group telling the story of what it's like to go through the process of trying to seek asylum in the United States. And they told the story for days, followed these different people, and then and they asked for donations at the end and it was really effective because people were already um, wrapped in at that point. This is another example I really love. This is a polar bear um, protection group that capitalized on National Poetry Month and shared on Instagram stories poems about polar bears. <laughs> and polar poetry was the hashtag and they found different poets to contribute. Um, and it might seem like kind of an unlikely pair polar bears and poetry month, but that, that surprise, that delight on social can go a really long way. And this also did raise uh, money successfully for that organization. I like too, how they have the, at the bottom, the, this is four of 30 or 26 of 30, because I think it clues people in that there's going to be a lot of these and just keeps them thinking about the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. New this year, Instagram launched the donation sticker. So now you can actually solicit donations directly through Instagram. Um, this is an example of a celebrity supporting an organization. So there's obviously the influencer side of this, but you should be thinking about how you want to um, first put out a lot of really great content and then ask for, for donations right through Instagram. Snapchat, similar to Instagram stories, this is um, another format where it goes away in 24 hours. And for Gen Z, Snapchat is really everything. Doesn't it go away much faster? 
a few seconds. Oh, you click through it faster, but it will completely disappear in a day. But yes, the rate at which people are clicking through is like, when I watch young people on, meaning Gen Zers on their phones, I can't even keep up. So, and this is a millennial. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this is an example from world wildlife fund. My last selfie was the hashtag and it was these endangered animals. Don't let this be my last selfie. Um, this was hugely successful and raised significant dollars with, I think Gen Z in particular, but young people across the board. Um, they hit their 30 day fundraising goal in three days with this campaign. Amazing. Because it's eye catching, it's very curated, which stands out on Snapchat because everything else looks very, you know, raw and mm-hmm. user generated. Um, so that's one thing to think about is how can I really catch people's attention so they'll stop and hold their finger on this for for a second longer. I think the beauty of this campaign, especially, is that they use the platform the native functionality of the platform and the disappearing factor Mm. of the platform to tie into their mission yeah of the whole species it's a really strong metaphor that it's physically disappearing Yeah. yeah that's so true twitter is typically not a platform that we would focus on for fundraising just because It's so tricky. Things are changing so fast. Trends are coming and going, and they're so dependent on the news and sort of pop culture, even more so than other platforms. But this example, um, this is another water organization, Water is Life. They capitalized on an existing hashtag, first world problems, which I'm sure many of you have heard that thrown around before, where they took real tweets, or at least seemingly real tweets, um, of people complaining about their first world problems, like this one says sat in the front row of a movie theater and my neck is sore and look at the photo that they've combined it with to just make you feel guilt shame Mm -hmm. all of those feelings that motivate people Mm -hmm. to give and to Mm -hmm. kind of wake up Um, this campaign raised over a million dollars in three months that's incredible by taking an existing hashtag that was getting a lot of traffic and a lot of attention and flipping it on its head. So that's how you can be successful on Twitter. You kind of have to make a bold statement on Twitter. YouTube, I feel, is kind of the black sheep hanging back in the shadows. It's the one when you said there were seven, everybody was like, huh, what's, I count what's six. number seven? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, But YouTube is not only the most popular social media platform in the world, it's the second largest search engine in the world. Everyone is using YouTube for different reasons, but Gen Z in particular is on YouTube constantly. They soak up so much video content and you can fundraise natively through YouTube. They do not charge a processing fee and they put out some new fundraising features this year. One of them is called Super Chat for Good, where you can actually host like a live auction type fundraiser and people can comment um, and give right there while you're running a live video. So Um, And YouTube advertising is pretty affordable and very effective. So this is a platform to explore. Um, Even if you don't have the capacity to create video content, you could still advertise here and target in some really, really um, effective ways. Cool. So I'm going to hand it back to Rachel to talk about design. Yeah. So our young audiences expect fresh design. This is a age that grew up uh, with Apple. So when you think about the change and how we all look at design and how important design has become to brands, a lot of that was ushered in with the age of Apple. Um, This audience grew up with um, software at their fingertips that allowed them to design. So they know how um, easy good design can be. It's no longer a differentiator, it's the cost of entry. It used to be that if you were a nonprofit and your stuff didn't look very good, people could say, well, you know, I get it. They don't wanna spend money on it. Now, um, if your stuff doesn't look at least decent, they start to doubt you. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, 
doubt creates doubt in other areas. So um, you don't want to give them any reason to doubt you or your capabilities. And remember that design is so often linked to technology that if your design's not good, they start to wonder if your technology is not good, if it's not safe, all those sort of things. A lot of people ask us, is there a point at which the design looks too good and it makes people think, ooh, why are they spending all their, their dollars on marketing instead mm -hmm. of programming? For people my age and younger, no. I mean, look at Charity Water and these orgs that are really successful. They have beautiful photography, beautiful design. Right. They, they just don't see it. that it, It's within reach for just about everybody now. So um, and with software like Canva, mm -hmm. um, you know, they can do a lot of the work for you, quite honestly. Young people want to be delighted. Don't we all? <laughs> uh, they want interaction. I'll show you an example of this. This is um, from an organization called Saturday Place. This was their donation uh, form page. And you'll notice when you land on the page, the first thing you see is the content that says, I will tip the scale in their favor. That is so empowering. It's such empowering language to think that you can have uh, an effect on the kids that go to their camp. Um, and so you can select how much you plan to give in the where it says I will give $100. You can change it there. You can also use that slider that's on the bottom of the page um, to change how much you give and the imagery and the content changes as you change your dollar amount. So there's a little bit of interaction happening there. The other thing I want to call out on the left side um, is right now we're, you know, the number is $100 and that's in the basics category, which is things like supplies, food, things like that. If you give $500 to $1,000, you're buying an experience. And just think of that language for a moment. You're buying an experience for a child. That, that feels really empowering, again. And then if you donate $2,500 plus, you're buying a future. Um, and so I just love how they use content and language here to really empower the donor, but also that little bit of delight with playing with the slider or seeing the images change out. Young donors also want to be included. They are participatory by nature. This is from the Millennial Impact Report, and it shows that they really want to be included through volunteerism. If you need a lot of volunteers within your organization, these audiences are great for bringing into your org for that purpose. 65% are more likely to volunteer if their coworkers do. 69% are more likely to give if there's a company match. Caroline gave that example earlier. And 77% are more likely to volunteer if they can use specific skills. What this means is a lot of these um, audiences are younger. They're looking to further their career. So say you have a writer, a Gen Z writer. They've just come out of college. They're looking to increase their portfolio. They might be willing to work with you to do some pro bono writing in exchange for getting some portfolio work for their um, book. So Think of it that way, how you can tap into them with their specific skills. And let's face it, they are skilled. <laughs> I have reached out to so many nonprofits, especially when I was right out of college to say, how can I help you? Do you need content, help with social, these things that you think they would jump on? And a lot of times I didn't get a response or it was just kind of like, well, we don't really know how to pull you in. Yeah. Or like pull you in for something small or quick, yeah. probably. Um, yeah. That, I'm sure there's, there's, um, challenges with that but you know even bringing them in on a project mm -hmm. like if you have a say you have a campaign you want to do for young audiences bring in someone to help you with the social aspect of that because it's it takes time they also want to be included through experiences they believe in the power of collective action again look at march for our lives um they believe in advocacy and peer-to-peer -peer, um things they want to bring their their peer groups together and get involved um, through participation. They also, um, as we've noted with these birthday fundraisers um, and other, we've seen the rise of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and event fundraising um, with these, these generations. They also want um, networking opportunities. Again, they're early in their career. They're looking for ways to meet people. They're often new to the city that they're living in and that you're in. Um, and so they're looking for those um, interactions. Also, having young people in your organization helps lend authenticity to the fact that you listen to them and you want them there. And young people beget more young people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they see others like them and think, you know, maybe I need to be there too. Um, also, in terms of events, they are looking for experiences and fun events to share with their friends. Again, with the rise of peer-to-peer. -peer. But if you think about things like um, Movember, 
the color runs, margarita runs. There's almost a run for everything now. And that's in part uh, come about with these generations who are looking for those fun experiences and things they can share on social as well. Um, consider satellite parties for your larger events. The Robin Hood Foundation does a great job of this. Um, they have a big gala. You know, I'm not sure what the ticket prices are, but I can guess they're pretty expensive, um, especially for younger audiences that don't have that kind of disposable income yet. And so what they do is they host another party sort of down the street at a pub, uh, which is meant to be for those to bring other people in who can't afford the high ticket gala prices um, to also interact and have a night for the organization. Again, those off the wall events. The image here is actually from um, CASA, their superhero run. And I love this event, I do it with my son. We've been doing it for years and talk about bringing in the younger audiences and Gen Z, you know, I'm sure most of these parents are having conversations with a child about why they're dressed up as superheroes and running. <laughs> And then again, give them images to share. You'll also notice that photo booths are at every event now, and that's because this audience loves to take photos and share them on social. Um, so think about how you can give them, capture those experiences. We also love anything that's nostalgic, the throwback mm -hmm. for us. Like I went to a fundraiser event this year that was all games from childhood, tetherball, four square tournaments with adults. Oh, that's and that's pretty cheap to put on. And people went first because of the activities and because it was a fundraiser second. Mm -hmm. But it got them in, right? Yes. In a way that made and then they really learned. Mm -hmm. Right. You also want to consider how you can include them in your brand. They want to be part of brands or a, consider themselves part of a brand that represents them and their values. Um, so they're really looking at a brand's values and determining whether they want to be part of it. Um, they want to see you as an extension of themselves. Who they align themselves with matters. Um, and they're very particular about the brands that they choose. See if you can give them a part that they can own. So what you're looking at here is an image, again, from that United Way for Greater Austin campaign we did with them um, all around making Austin greater. And so we created this frame that people could stand behind, and it basically says, you make Austin greater. And this was used to defense and in other places around the city. Also in that campaign, it was a fill in the blank campaign. So people could put in what makes Austin greater to them. And so you'll see here that they use it in lots of different ways. They use it for fundraising, things like giving back makes Austin greater, but also for tying into the greater Austin community, things like queso makes Austin greater and live music. This is a view of a couple of corporate partners for United Way. On the left, it says Deloitte makes Austin greater. That's chalked into a sidewalk at a cleanup event. Uh, volunteer event. And then on the right, um, the Samsung break room wall. So those of you familiar with United Way knows that a lot of their money comes from employee giving. They partner with Samsung to have their employees donate through their campaign. And so this is a place where all the employees participating in the campaign have written in what makes Austin greater to them. So you see they have a, a part to play in the campaign and their voice is heard about what makes Austin greater. We also developed a mural for them, the You're My Butter Half mural. And the idea of this originally was just to do a love letter back to Austin. It was not a fundraiser. Um, it's really just a, um, a piece of art that's given back to the community as part of their campaign. So it started as something just sort of, you know, they have this building on the east side, which is a really popular area for younger people. It's becoming more hip. Um, and so, What's happened though, as a response to that, is that people have come and taken all kinds of photos with it. Um, we've had graduation parties and families and um, organizations come. People have gotten engaged in front of the mural, have had pop-up weddings. Um, <laughs> my favorite might actually be the older couple. In front so of precious. It. Yeah, so just across the board, you know, getting people involved with your organization um, matters. Also consider how you can include them on your board or committee. Um, you may need to help them with financial assistance. Most of us for our boards, we have a give or get policy where the board is expected to help fundraise. Um, these, or, these generations can do that, but they don't necessarily have the networks yet um, that some of your other board members may have. So you may have to help them there or have a little bit different metric for them in that regard. They will offer more diversity to your board, not just in terms of um, 
age and race, but also in terms of viewpoint. You know, they know what the latest technologies are. They use them for the most part. So bringing new ideas and innovation into your organization is a good thing. And they may push you to think differently, and hopefully they will push you to think differently. We hear from a lot of organizations that their boards are made up of a certain type of person that is older, they're whiter, and they're um, kind of, you know, they've been there a long time. Old school. Old school. Old school. <laughs> they're looking for new ideas, and bringing younger people onto your board um, might be a way to do that. Okay, so wrapping up, let's take a look at our takeaways and our next steps. Um, so first things first, technological prowess is crucial. If your tech isn't working properly, that's the number one thing I would fix. Go in there and make sure that you're not asking for form fields that you don't need um, and that you're not asking people to create an account unless it's absolutely necessary. Good design is the cost of entry. Again, um, they expect good design now. They know what bad design looks like and what good design looks like, and they expect you to be up and, and, and fresh in that area. Take note of for-profit trends like subscription models. If you think of Netflix, Spotify, BarkBox, all mm. those have come about in the last few years. They are clearly having success. Um, these generations are more used to paying for something on a monthly subscription basis. So how can you push that monthly giving to those, those generations? And I would add, think about how you can partner up with for-profit companies that young people already really like. Um, cause we're used to that social enterprise Tom's kind of model of the two being interlinked. And we really like that. Let young people participate and shape your campaigns. So they're there. They often want to help. Um, how can you let them into your brand, which can be terrifying for the brand managers among us, but, um, you know, with good guidelines, you can curate and get them involved. And the kicker is that following these best practices works for young people, but you know what? It works for everyone. Who doesn't like technology that works or good design, <laughs> right? So it won't hurt you to put these things in place with your older generations. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Caroline, for joining me. Always sure. Fun. Thank you. Um, we have more free webinars and recordings, tools, templates available at mightycitizen.com slash tools. We have, if you're thinking about doing a, a campaign to young audiences, we have a free marketing campaign template that you can download and it has all kinds of the questions that you should be thinking about as you're strategizing your campaign. And we also have a fundraising campaign metrics template. So um, if you're gonna be putting a campaign into place, this has all the metrics you might need to figure out how successful your campaign was. All right, thanks and we'll see you again.